my name's Colleen Getty, and I'm with The Room to Write, and we're shooting another episode of the Journey of a Story series. And today we are talking to Sarah Desmond, the wonderful Sarah Desmond. Uh, and she has her debut short story collection, uh, What We may, Might Become, I was going to say May Become. Uh, welcome, Sarah. So it's excited nice to, to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to start off by just like, if you want to explain, just to, because to hit home the idea that there is no one way of writing, there's no one uh schedule or whatever uh maybe kind of just tell us how do you physically like in your space write like what do you use to write and, and your habits and stuff like that yeah um i write uh we live in a really old house um in melrose massachusetts and um Initially, we moved into this house um, during the pandemic, actually, so oh. it's kind of a, a, a newer house to us. Um, and prior to that, we lived in an even older house <laughs> 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 a few streets over. Um, and I wrote in a third floor um, attic space that was also a guest room. And my kids had a little playroom up there and mm -hmm. um, electric baseboard heating to chase the chill because it was freezing in the winter and sweltering <laughs> in the summer. And um, I would write in this space that looked out on all of these beautiful trees and through the neighborhood because it was up on a hill and I had a beautiful view of the whole kind of nice. neighborhood and definitely constructed stories from um, that vantage point um, for a long time. And then um, in, the, in the new writer's space, um, just as old a house, but, <laughs> but it's a little bit more of a proper office um, with, uh, Still a good view, but I look out over a, a busy street, and um, uh, I've not kind of um, been as generative in that space as I was for the for the ten prior years in the attic space. But um, I'm working towards that again. Um, I write on a laptop um, if I'm writing fiction, if I'm in a class, or um, if I'm teaching a class, or if I'm a participant in a class. Um, I'm writing in a journal. Um, my daily practice is um, for a long time when I was kind of drafting the stories that are in this collection, um, I would draft them on the computer, on the laptop, and um, you know, in multiple iterations, I would I would edit. So I'd I'd keep a folder for every story, and when there was like a major overhaul, I'd create a new file in that same hmm. folder. Um, and you ever print them out and yeah, do that, or so is actually, it always I have a, on the I have, a, um, I have a photo of that that I've, ah. I've shared with your staff here. <laughs> um, but you can see in one of the photos, there's kind of a big cork board that I have all of the stories laid out in sequence as ah. a way of kind of um, thinking about, about sequence. That's a really um, challenging bit to putting together a collection, at least it was for me. Yeah. Um, and I played with that for a really long time. Um, like and visually? Final. Yeah, on the cork board, Physically. I had each, like once I reached a point where every story was in final form, um, I would resequence them. Actually, um, I spent a lot of time doing doing this, which was that I, um, I, I tried to think about how, I think there's a picture that I also included of this too, of, of like how different stories were, were connected with um, certain themes. They're all connected thematically in some regard, but for a long time, I thought maybe I would try to make them all um, connected via ancillary characters as well, so mm. that like an Olive Kittredge or something like that. And so mm. I started cataloging different um, characters in each of the stories and trying to figure out if I could um, create a, a more interwoven narrative that way. Yeah. Um, I eventually gave up on that idea. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say, and did you? Because that sounds complicated. Yeah, I, you know, it kind of felt like. Um, it, it felt like I was um, putting a square peg in a, a round hole for some yeah, of it because okay. they are disparate in setting. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it would have worked for some stories, but would have been a real, um, as the kids would say, a force <laughs> um, for other stories. And I wanted to avoid doing that um, right. and having it feel inauthentic or something like that. So, And yeah. in your space, you're saying, uh, if I'm understanding your fancy word, yeah. <laughs> uh, that you feel like you're not doing as much writing in your new space yeah. as you did in your prior space. Yeah. 
because uh, there's a busy street. But uh, I'm wondering, I feel like you're just the right person to ask this question <laughs> to. Uh, like, as writers, and honestly, as anyone who creates anything, I think, mm -hmm. sometimes you feel, you start to feel like if you're not actually physically creating something, whether it's on your computer and, you know, on a pen and paper or whatever, you know, whatever your craft is, that you're not creating. But I'm wondering how much you're actually collecting, like even if you're just people watching, I mean, yeah. how can you tell stories if you don't see stories happening and see characters? So uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little philosophical about <laughs> how we can actually count the time where we're not physically writing and that we're actually collecting stories and can we give ourselves a break? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think, I think it's probably something like, uh, for me at least, probably like a 75-25 split, mm -hmm. where 75% of the time I'm, I'm kind of thinking about the stories and 25% of the time I'm actually writing them. Um, in writing this collection, I think things kind of, um, certain stories, I'm not very good at multiple projects at the same time. I kind of, I know you are. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> You're really good at that. Um, so I really need to kind of, concentrate on one storyline at a time. Um, and so I, um, I've, I've been a runner in my life for a while and uh, I think about those stories and live with those characters when I'm running and things like that. I have given up running now for several, <laughs> several years kind of as a <laughs> obsessive experiment because I am a, uh-oh. Oh, technical, oh, technical. Oh, that's okay. Uh -oh. It'll Really? It'll sway in the breeze, right. or is that okay? <laughs> I'm just gonna put it there. How's that? Um, yeah, I, I think like I've um, thought more about my characters and kind of lived with them by um, other rituals like walking, running, mm. um, the quiet reading. Time. Like I count reading as writing. That, yeah. that's like a you know, if we're not reading, we're not really learning anything, and we're not thinking about um, our work in relation. To in, in relationship with other works and so I count that as as work or writing also even if it's not yeah. the physical um, act of doing that right um, so and then you the could 25%. be more productive in your new space and you just don't know it yet <laughs> yeah I just like I if, if I had to like clock come. number of pages <laughs> <laughs> written so do you I, have a goal uh, like when you sit down do you have a goal and how often do you sit down do you try to do it at the same time like what do, is there a ritual to it or do you just whenever you can get a moment yeah, I I would say, you know, there there's a kind of obsessiveness to writing, um, and if I'm in a story, or if I've, you know, if I've, I've, I've collected whatever it is from the ether that becomes the story, um, I really get obsessive about that story until I've created like a full draft. Mm -hmm. um, and I did after I finished this collection, I I did go ahead and and write a novel, and that was a very different experience than than this. I mean. Here, here it is, and all. Wow, the <laughs> there it is. It's glory, but it's not. Um, it needs to be entirely, you know, redrafted and revisited. It's, right. Um, it's not finished, but it's it's complete, Amazing. but it's not finished. Right. Um, and I'd say that's a very different immersive experience than, like, writing just a, a short story. Right. Which is more bite-sized, of course. Well, and when you were saying that, I'm thinking like, how satisfying, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. to. The short story has its challenges, mm -hmm. but in terms of physical space it takes up in the world, yes. uh, it's doable if you can find that chunk of, like you said, I mean, I can see wanting to see it to its very end and uh, the challenge of fitting it succinctly into one uh -huh. story. Uh, and even though we try to be mindful of keeping within a certain amount of time here, I feel like we could go <laughs> for hours. Uh, and I'll try to rein my questions in. but. Uh, Focusing on your short story, although I feel like I'm going to seep into the novel yeah, we there. Don't, we don't uh, even need to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, just in comparison of your experiences. Um, but starting with the short story, I think it's really interesting. Uh, in you know, you can devote whatever time in this answer you want, but of how so maybe you have so many lessons of just how to do a story arc that helps you with your novel afterwards, and maybe you can talk yeah. a little bit about how. Where do you do, how do you get your idea for these stories? Mm -hmm. Are all of them totally different ways? Uh, you know, yeah. what's that process? Great question. Many, many, many parts to that question. <laughs> yeah, see sorry. what I can address here, no. Um, so I'm really interested in the kind of, I, I think my stories start from a place of um, 
speculation or like what if places. So, um, you know, um, to give an example of something that may have started as a as a what if example, I I, I had an experience once um, walking my dog in the in the fells um, in the woods um, many years ago. Um, I was pregnant with my uh, first daughter, and I had kind of like a like a like a, a scary experience in the woods, and mm. and then I from that individual experience had a what if moment that I kind of wrote into a into a story that became um, a highly mm. fictionalized version of <laughs> of what actually happened that day. Um, so things begin for me with these kinds of of what if moments, but also um, I'm a really character driven mm -hmm. um, storyteller, so I really kind of cling to interesting character details or um, uh, unique ways of being in the world. Um, I love to write dialogue. I listen a lot. Um, I love to take the train <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think I'm constantly kind of harvesting yeah. the things from the, my overall environment. Um, and I think that's a great sort of tip for people that are wondering, where do I start? You know, a lot of times people, I don't know where to start. Yeah. I love the, this, this is something that happened, but now I'm going to just go have fun mm -hmm. with it and make it completely fictional. That's right. a great sort of writing prompt you could give yourself. Right, right. Love that. Um, and then I think with respect to, I, I was speaking before about obsession a little bit. I think, I think there are things consciously or subconsciously that we are all ob obsessed with mm -hmm. um, and that writing is kind of a way of figuring out the kind of the larger meanings of those obsessions um, and I think what I realized on the other side of creating this collection was that um, I'm very much interested in maybe even obsessed with the idea <laughs> of, of in-between spaces or liminal spaces um, I love adolescent characters in particular, so there are a ton of teenagers in this collection. Um, I love them because they're like neither child nor adult, but mm -hmm. they like kind of, you know, exist in that threshold um, space that is um, peppered with kind of both of those worlds. Yeah. Um, so you'll see a lot of adolescents in there. There are a lot of um, the veteran just recently returned home from war. There's a new widower. There's a um, um, an artist who's going through a recent loss. Loss. There's, you know, so people in these in-between spaces, grief spaces, mm. um, that I think I'm really curious about and interested in. Yeah. And so, and I was a longtime high school English teacher, and so yeah. I have some experience <laughs> with adolescence too. Lots of things to too. harvest <laughs> there. Yeah. So would you? I, I'm. This is adult, right? Or yes. Yes. It, does it go into? New, um, I wouldn't new adult, they call it, yeah, or young adult. Or I, I wouldn't, it, no. it's literary fiction, so okay. I, would, I would classify it as for an adult audience, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, some, when I think of, oh, short stories I've read as, you know, whatever, throughout my life, mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to figure out and want the audience to have an idea of what, I know there probably isn't, there's no one category, although you're saying it's sort of the in-between spaces, but, uh, is there a mystery? Is it drama? Is it dealing with grief? Is it uh, transitional? Like, is there sort of uh, a theme in terms of the types of stories there are? Like, how do you get? How do? How does the reader want to get from starting to know this character to mm. finding out what happens to them? Like, what's the? Yeah. So there. I mean, there's there. None of the characters are linked in this, right? So thematically, it's linked um, by that kind of that threshold feeling of. Um, I mean, I think the characters within are kind of trying to figure out, um, you know, how to how to navigate these these liminal moments in their lives, or these mm. these moments of loss, these moments of grief, um, these moments of uncertainty. I think that's what binds them together. Um, but I think that uh, each one reflects kind of a you know, not a uniform. Um, rendering of the threshold experience, mm. right? Um, it's literary fiction, so realistic literary fiction in the, um, there, there are a few stories that do kind of bend um, 
speculative or, or like surreal in that way. Um, and those are some of the newer stories in um, the collection. There's a story about um, you know, a young adolescent who essentially um, has, has been, um, has come into the world as a, as a, an experiment in like um, artificial intelligence um, generative, uh, generating young children, right? Um, wow. And so uh, she, the adolescent now is coming of age in this, in this time where she has been somewhat of an experiment and yeah. um, all of the complications that kind of come along with that. So that's a, probably the newest story in the yeah. collection, which I wrote. And that feels like, I think what all <laughs> of us feel like, right? <laughs> We're I, all I kind think, of being yeah. experimented on. We yeah. don't know how this right. is gonna end. That's so that could if, be really right? interesting. And there's uh, a what if moment in Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, that's so cool. So um, what is the, like, were all these written within a certain amount of a time period, or was it sort of like, you know, you've written these over the years and you just wanted to harvest the ones that yeah. you really, really loved? Good question. So I, I um, you know, I brought actually, um, this is like a, I don't know how old this manuscript is, but so this is, this was kind of like an original version of the manuscript before. It actually has a different title then. Oh yeah? Um, what and then was like it gonna a, be? Here, here, take a look. Yeah. That's the title page, but then if you flip it over, Sometimes you can see so like me reordering the sequence of stories, many of which are, are in the collection, but they're very, um, they are very different. Um, some of them I have taken out of this collection. Um, some are newer stories. I think the oldest story in there was um, written during my um, graduate program when I was actually pregnant with my oldest daughter, who's now 16. So, um, you know, so the oldest story in here might be 16 years old, right? Okay. And the youngest is just a couple of years ago. Um, you know. And how do you decide? Ooh, I'm not gonna. You know, when you're saying one of them was gonna be in there right. and it isn't, I. How I think it just wasn't as out? strong a story as as some of the others, and it, it thematically kind of felt like a stretch or like a reach to be part of the other part of the kind of thematic cohesiveness, and so I mm -hmm. I substituted it with. Okay. Um, the, the manuscript was actually accepted um, by people? the press. Writing is messy. <laughs> it should it's be. It's so messy. <laughs> I love There's it. There's so many notes on it. Um, <laughs> It was accepted by the press actually with the former story in it, and then I okay. asked them if I could swap out because I just personally was not happy with that right. that story, and they they were very deferential and lovely to work with. I cannot say enough good things and about. What was what was um, this? Cornerstone Press? Cornerstone okay. Press. Okay, <laughs> I so love them. Um, they've yeah. been very good to me. Um, okay. They are a um, a teaching press actually through the University of Wisconsin at Stevens yeah. Point. Um, which is a little bit like um, a teaching hospital, for instance, right? Where okay. um, you know they have an overall director, who and you know editor who's working very um, closely with each of the authors and making the selections for which books they'll decide to to publish in that calendar year. Um, but then they have an editorial staff that consists of some graduate students and some undergraduate students who you know, work directly on the manuscript um, oh, with you. And um, they've all been really lovely to work yeah. with. Like there's an editorial kind of um, overseer who's a student. She's liaising with the director of the, the program. So, you know, he's kind of my direct contact, but then these students are also getting firsthand experience in publishing. Yeah, and, what a really cool um, Editing and. For both of you. Yeah, both it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it was a really nice experience. Uh, so did they tell you it has to be a certain amount of pages? Like, was this your own self-limiting in terms of how many stories, how many pages, or how did you yeah, come to Yeah, I mean, I think in in general, you know, a, you can't have probably a, a collection that's any less than 150 pages or so, right? Okay. Um, but 11 stories was was my own choice. I probably could have kept the other story in there and made and made 12. They had no limitations around that. I okay. think depending on whether you're working with kind of a, a larger press or a small independent press, which is, or university press, which is um, what Cornerstone is, um, they have different kind of guidelines and things. And certainly when you're submitting, they're, they're sharing those guidelines with you and um, 
it, it does behoove you to, <laughs> to follow them and know, know what they're looking for and, and read what they've um, published in the past so you know what kind of aesthetic and style right. they're curious about and interested in. Um, uh, quick question. Well, sure. I don't know. Maybe not. Quick question. <laughs> <laughs> quick interruption yeah. to ask a question. Yeah. Um, so I've never talked to anyone who's gone through a, did you say univer or teaching press, a university press? University press, yeah. uh, Which I think is really interesting. And so I do want to yeah. kind of just talk about that a little bit. Uh, so, oh, so many universities and colleges have magazines. Yeah. So did you submit to their school magazine first, and then they kind of already knew you, or what was yeah. that like? If you can kind of tease yeah, out that sure. whole process. So of I finished this manuscript probably in um, like 2000. Or I thought I had finished it <laughs> in 2017, <laughs> probably. Okay. Um, and tried to go out in the direction of agency and to, to larger presses. With a short story collection, it's really challenging to get a, an agent um, because they really want to try to sell a novel. And certainly, like, commercial right. novels are going to make, you know, the most amount of money for them. And um, not disparaging the agent experience at all. Right. Um, but it's a business. Know, and it is a business. People have to understand that, yep. Hard. It's economics, and it, it's a real gamble to take a, a risk on a short story collection. It has been done. There have been very successful, um, you know, short story collections that have gone on to win big prizes and things. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Olive Kittredge is, is one of those um, collections by um, Strout. But um, it's 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 not it's not a sure thing for them all of the time. And so, mm -hmm. if they're committing to a short story collection, they'll say something like. This is beautiful. Right. Do you also have a novel? And I'd be like, ah, almost. <laughs> <laughs> We're not on that. quite. I'm working. <laughs> right. So I did was have that. Like, I just yeah. even interrupt my interrupting question. That was, was part, that of, part of the catalyst it of was doing a novel? A okay. little bit. Okay. Um, I did have a novel I idea. Um, I just hadn't yet. I didn't understand how integrated those were if you wanted to go the agented traditional right. publishing route. Okay. Um, and so I did have several agents say to me, you know, I really love your collection. I'd love to represent it, but any number of things. Okay. My schedule is full right right now. I'd love to see your novel. I'm not sure. I'd like to you know sell them together as like a right, two book right. deal. Could we do a collection and a novel together that come okay. out you know you know a year and a half or two yeah. years apart? That is a much more palatable kind of package right. than them taking a gamble on something when they don't know if they have another you know yeah. book in the pipeline. So okay, that makes so sense. I had several agents who who did you know, come back with that kind of feedback. And I would say, like, agent agent experience is, um, it's, like, not for the faint of heart. No. <laughs> it is an incredibly um, um, frustrating and disheartening experience in that, yes. you know, you, you believe in, in your work as you do, and you should as a, as, a, as a writer who's worked very hard on something that you're personally committed to. Um, and they're not particularly great about getting back. And yeah. you may feel like you have contacted them six times before you decide you're going to redline that on your on your right. you know spreadsheet. Um, getting those random rejections in the yeah, <laughs> so, or like, like or oh, nothing great at all. To start you know, my no, day no rejection, no acceptance. There's <laughs> like crickets, yeah. you know. Um, and so, after a long time of, of trying to do that with the collection, I put it down and really concentrated on finishing the novel. Um, when I finished the novel, I went back to those, I had like three agents who were like, if you have a novel, I'd love to see it. Mm -hmm. Went back to them. At that point, one was like, lovely, but I don't want to spend, it was in the pandemic, I don't want to spend, um, you know, the next 18 months like working on a book about grief because that's what the, right. the novel's okay. about, yeah. about grief. <laughs> um, and I understand that right. perspective very much. Timing is everything, you know, but yes. And now I think we're in a different place, right. um, and it needs a full overhaul. And I, I will, uh, I need to get back to it, and then see where we are again. But um, so ultimately, that didn't go anywhere. But I started to think, like, I still really believe in this project. Mm. Um, of the eleven stories, like four of them have been published in in other, you know, literary okay. magazines or journals. And I would say, like, you know, that's probably your greatest avenue into publishing is start. Start publishing, you know, smaller. You know, right. you may not go out and get like a debut novel deal, right? That's highly unlikely um, right. from a, like a just a numbers game. Um, those those deals happen, and we hear about them all the time. So I think we think they're 
more prevalent than they actually are, but it's an extremely small percentage of the writing population is getting a deal like that. Mm. Um, so publish, you know, publish the stories you believe in, publish the essays you believe in, go to the bigger, you know, literary magazines that are widely regarded as being, you know, exceptional. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there I could name a bunch of, of different ones, but so so four of these were published in, in various journals in the um, Los Angeles Review, um, the Kenyan Review, um, Waterstone Review, which is a little bit of a smaller one, um, and then Cutthroat, which is uh, out of Colorado. It's a journal for the arts. So okay. if you can get things into smaller presses and literary magazines, sometimes editors and agents take note in that way. Right. Um, and then you and can say. It's giving you experience too yes. with getting your confidence up after all the rejections. That's I've right. I've gotten plenty of those too, Sarah. I mean, so I yeah. Know. <laughs> years, years yeah, of rejections, yes. right? But then you can say when you're querying, you know, uh, another journal or literary magazine or an agent, you know, my work has been previously published in mm -hmm. and list those accolades and, and that looks right. Looks like you know what you're doing. Right. <laughs> it looks like you have some literary chops in some capacity, and, and that right. really lends itself to, I think, being no, being noticed, and um, you know maybe that was part of the avenue that that led to Cornerstone. But I, you know, I put. So the, had you heard of Cornerstone, or how did that? So how, I have a really good friend who um, is from my. Um, I did go and get a um, MFA in fiction. Um, yeah, when my as I said before, when my when I was pregnant with my with my okay. oldest daughter, so it's been a long time. I graduated in in 2010 from that program, so um, she has been an incredible help. She's an author too. She's uh, she published with a with a big press. She has some uh, two books, a collection of fiction, uh, short stories that went out first, but again, like a two book kind of right, deal, right. and then a novel that came after that. Her name's Robin MacArthur. She's wonderful. And um, you know, I think over time she grew maybe more disillusioned with the industry, and she was mm -hmm. like, you know, I, know I like, why aren't you trying more small presses? Why aren't you mm -hmm. like thinking about independent presses, university presses? Like they're taking your they're taking work like this. Your work is beautiful. Like don't give up on it. Um, so I did take her advice there, and I started to. There's some great presses like University of New Mexico has a great press. University of Virginia and West Virginia have a, a wonderful press. Um, you know, this is University of Wisconsin. Um, the, there's university presses all over the U.S. and then there's smaller oh, independent it's so presses. So wonderful like, to know, yes. honestly. And they have like query periods or like open reading periods. Some of which, okay. like you, are very short. Like it'll be a month where they have open submissions for a collection or for a right. novel. Um, and you know, do your homework. Keep your spreadsheets, like right. write down all of your submission times. You know, mark it. You know, mark it when it's been submitted, and then and then wait on it. Use Submittable, which is an amazing. Yeah. Uh, Did platform. you find they were any faster than traditional they were. agent editor? Like yes. I'm thinking, if it's a university, it probably has a very yeah. I think I submitted in February, and I of um, not last year, but the year before. So it is a long process to publication. So I think. I submitted in February of 2020. Oh yeah, of 2023, I was accepted in like um, April of 2023, mm. and they were like, we, "We will publish by October of 2024." Wow. So you know, you are in like an 18-month kind of. Yeah. That still feels but actually still, pretty right. Tight. The yeah. turnaround, at least yeah. knowing there's a, a something happening, I feel like that's faster than you yes, normally. Yes, like hear. I heard within like six weeks of submitting, which was really right. like. Partner, Usually you know? it's like first you gotta get an agent. Right. Once you get That's that, right. then you gotta get an you That's know, right. like and then it's mm -hmm. you know, uh, it could be forever. Right. So and it is like that. Really it's hard cool. to kind of endure that yes. the slog. It's yeah. you know, so um so I have I can say nothing but incredible things Good. about like small presses, university yes. presses that I know like so many great books are coming out of there too, like right. like Milkweed and Black Lawrence Press is a great press, Soft Skull Press. Um Coffee House Press is a great one. Um, there's so many small presses that are doing really good work. That's the awesome. other press is another one. Um, yeah, thank you for yeah. all. I mean, honestly, I feel like it was like every <laughs> every author I talk to has 
a different experience, which is why it's always so interesting. Yeah. And then just there's always like, oh, let me open the door a little more and show you what's <laughs> over here. Yeah. Uh, so that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to now I'm taking a, la a sharp left because yeah, sure. uh, I don't want to yeah. lose the full focus on sure. this specific short story. Um, you know, obviously, the uh, with the show, we want to help other writers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. feel motivated to get information but also we want to find out about uh, authors and their yeah. pieces so uh it's a series of 11 stories right. uh and any one in particular you want to like pick out as your baby that you want to just kind of mm -hmm. even just talk briefly about the actual process of writing it yeah sure um there is one that um, uh, which is called Cicadas, and it is um, a short story that I wrote um, from that that third store or third story <laughs> studio that I told you about in the attic. Um, it's very much like a neighborhood story. Um, the idea for the for that and the impetus for that was definitely gleaned from my kind of you know my suburban Boston um, <laughs> life, and. Um, it's a very quiet story. I think um, people have told me very various things about it. Like they, they see it as a story about grief, which I can understand that interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's a story about motherhood. It's a story about alcoholism. It's a story about a lot of different things. But um, it's, uh, it changed quite a bit over the course of its um, drafting. and. Um, when I was finished with it, I submitted it to the Kenyan Review, which um, I hold in like very high regard. Um, it's a like incredibly old and um, highly revered literary magazine. Um, I submitted it there uh, maybe in 2010 or 2011, so this is quite a while ago. Right. Um, and I I was accepted the, to the Kenyan Review, which was like wow. my my biggest best accomplishment oh, wow. <laughs> as a writer to that date yeah. very uh, encouraging certainly and then I worked with a wonderful editor David Lynn who um, you know I hadn't really worked I had worked with other editors on other stories that had been accepted but um, the feedback that he gave me was really tuned and um, deferential I, I guess you know like he, at the end of the day it was they were my choices to make but um, he really had me thinking differently about the story. Mm. Um, and then it was published in the Kenyan Review. And then they had me actually read it on <laughs> online. Wow. So it's, you, can, you can kind of listen to the story if you go to the Kenyan Review oh, archives. You can listen to it. And, you know, I don't have, like, a fancy recording studio or, like, any <laughs> recording equipment. And this being 20, I think, right. 10 or 11, you know, I was recording it on, you know, my phone with yeah. the microphone app. And... They gave you different kind of tips and tricks for how to record without background noise mm -hmm. and without an echo. So I <laughs> sat yeah. in the foot of my closet, like surrounded <laughs> by, <laughs> by clothes and like <gasps> a laundry basket. I feel like that somehow <laughs> were, is perfect for the story, just how you yeah. briefly described it, absorbed it too, all right? of the echoes and all <laughs> of the extra sound. Um, had a big glass of water in there just so it didn't get, you know, pasty and dry. Harsh, yeah. And, um, Oh wow, that's really cool. Yeah, it was cool. very cool. Yeah. It was really cool to see that come to life. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that sounds like a wonderful first process for you. Like honestly, I don't think I realized when you submitted a short story, you actually have access to someone who will give you feedback in an editor that I mm -hmm. think that's almost incentive to try to do that enough yes. even, you know, mm -hmm. is to actually get that feedback cuz Totally agree. Um that seems very valuable. Experience. I don't know if they all, you know, to what degree that happens with different presses, but in every, almost every press that I've, um, or literary magazine that I've submitted to, um, there's been some kind of editorial feedback of some kind, oh, right? Um, and you're either like, you know, you're track, they're tracking changes and you're accepting or not accepting right. those changes, really? right? Interesting. Um, which is really a, a like a, really cool process also because yeah. you know whether you're working with a team or you're working with an individual you know it's a very subjective process so right um you have to also be able to kind of like know the story you want to tell so that right. you don't 
allow yourself to be necessarily for it to take a soul. turn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For it to take a turn you didn't expect it to take, or for right. it to be a different story than you intended. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, that's really cool. Uh, so much wonderful information. Oh. <laughs> uh, I have to wrap it up, which I hate to do. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell you, time, time flies. Um, but um, I guess I just want to end it with uh, asking you, you know, what for people that are are wanting to get their work mm -hmm. out, wanting to stick with writing, uh, what piece of advice would you give to them? Keep going. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to, it's really hard to kind of think in our busy lives, raising children and working and things like that, where to find the time to do that. And I think over the landscape of our lives, that changes quite a bit. Um, that used to be only at night when my children were sleeping. Now they go to bed later than I do sometimes. So, <laughs> so that doesn't work, right? Um, is it going to be really early morning before anybody's awake? Is it going to be really early Saturday morning before anyone's awake? Um, you know, really finding the time to do that and giving yourself the space to do that, even when you think, you know, you don't have it. Um, steal away to the library, steal away to a coffee shop, although I can't do that. <laughs> we have like full silence in the black box. Like I think right, I'm okay. in a, in a, yeah. like a noisy environment. But if you can do that, um, you have you, you owe it to yourself to to tell the stories you have. Everybody's got one. So Ooh, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. This Thank you wonderful. so much for having me. I Thank really you enjoyed for coming. this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and if anybody else would like to talk about their process of coming up with an idea and bringing it to published uh, products, then feel free to contact me at theroomtowrite.org.